Good afternoon. I'll call it the afternoon at this point. Uh, so today the league released its ninth edition of the CEO tenure and retention study. This is the first year that we're releasing it solely online. Um, so, uh, but today we're fortunate to be joined by three of our um, presidents and chancellors plus Analytica uh, who created uh, with us the dashboard that we'll talk about. So um, first, uh, uh, what, what I'm gonna do is just give a very brief background on the, the tenure and retention study that the league does. And I will mention a, a few of the key findings and then uh, how to use the dashboard that will be done by our, our friends at Analytica who can explain uh, how, how best to utilize the dashboard. And then we're fortunate to be joined by Chancellor Constance Carroll, Superintendent President Jose Fierro, and uh, President Tawny Dotson for a little bit of a discussion about their perspectives on the findings in the ninth edition of the tenure and retention study. And also we'll go, we'll go beyond that just about their experiences uh, in this overused term, but extraordinary time. So with that, uh, the, the CEO tenure and retention study, this, as I said, is the, is the ninth edition that the league has done. Um, you, can, you can go to the next slide if you, if you might, thank you. And it was launched in 1995. Both some CEOs at the time and some trustees were concerned with the short tenure that they had been seeing in California compared to uh, presidents and chancellors and superintendent presidents nationally, California, the tenure uh, was, was a bit shorter for presidents at the time. And so there was a concern and, and the thought was, well, let's do an analysis to see if we can figure out why this is happening. So it started in 1995 and uh, we have done this biennially uh, ever since. So now we're at the ninth edition that we'll be releasing today. So how do we find out about what's happening? I, you know, we're, we're such a large, such a large system of uh, community colleges. Uh, we count about 139 positions. That's either chancellor, superintendent, president, or college president. So we monitor the news media. Uh, we have conversations. Uh, we check in with the districts, and we look at board announcements and news releases. As I said, we, we publish these biennial updates and we have added this interactive dashboard, which is available on our website. We'll, we'll get more into that. It's, I think it's a very useful tool. I, I hope you take advantage of it. So the, the, ninth, the ninth edition uh, or study uh, gives an overview of the tenure rates, we look at some of the demographic trends and, and other elements. So let's get into a little bit about what this year's study uh, or, or what we found in, in this year's uh, study. Um, but first, the, yeah, the, the, a, a question is, you know, why does this matter? Why should we even care about CEO tenure and retention? For some, it's an obvious question. For others, it might be uh, not so obvious. Uh, it, the research that we've done, we've found that it's correlated with uh, both organizational and uh, both organizational stability and financial sustainability. Um, that CEOs, and I'm going to use the term CEO as we do in the report to encompass superintendent presidents, chancellors, and college presidents. CEOs with a longer tenure, you tend to see at the district and the colleges greater organizational stability and financial su sustainability. Uh, no guarantees, but that's, there seems to be a correlation with, with the two. Additionally, um, even though uh, the Aspen Institute Prize for the top community colleges has its own set of uh, concerns or issues, and some people think it's uh, more political than anything, uh, they do try to highlight the top community colleges in the nation. 
And uh, Aspen has pointed out that in several cases, when you have a CEO, a college president or a chancellor who's been in their seat for longer than 10 years, there seems to be a larger number of those colleges and districts winning the Aspen Prize or being in the top 10. Arguably, it's never been more difficult to be a college president or chancellor uh, at the community college level. And this bulleted list uh, is just a part, a small part of what the expectations are. Uh, if you've read any of the job descriptions or job announcements for new CEO positions, uh, it says everything except for uh, can you know leap tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, it, you know the expectations for what a CEO should bring to a district or, or college are immense. But these are some of the examples of what are what are expected: managing budgets, raising dollars. Uh, navigating constituent relations, addressing the student basic needs and, and student success, monitoring and, and maintaining a, a, a campus climate that's uh, effective and um, uh, facilitates the best, the best work by everybody. Of course, there's accreditation reporting requirements from the state and federal level. Oh yeah, then you have to do strategic and institutional planning. And then by the way, you have to pass a bond. Oh yes, and, and uh, pass, engage in local state and federal advocacy. And then you have to find hours of the day where you can actually think uh, and contemplate what your, your moves are for the short and longer term. And then you also have to find sleep. Uh, as, as well. So it's uh, exceptionally challenging jobs. So what did we find in this in this latest report? Next slide, please. So these are some of the key findings. Um, historically, there are over 1200 individuals have served in California Community College uh, executive positions. Uh, right now, four, uh, well, four of the five longest serving leaders in the history of California Community College uh, leadership position are women. Uh, and we're speaking to one of those today, of course, uh, Dr. Constance Carroll. Um, in April of 2020, there were, of the CEOs in California, a full 45% uh, were women, making it the largest recorded number of women CEOs in the CCC system with 59. So that it's pretty remarkable. It does not, of course, match the population of the state, nor does it match the population of the student body, where, of course, there are more women in the California Community College uh, student body than there are men. Um, but compared to many states, uh, we're in a in a decent position, and compared to the other two public higher education systems in California, the percentage of women CEOs that we have is greater than that uh, than the numbers at CSU and UC. Uh, approximately 16% of the CEOs identify as uh, Latinx. Uh, California is no surprise, has a larger percentage of Latinx CEOs, um, more diverse than the national average, about twice the national average. At the same time, again, if you compare those numbers, the number of uh, Latinx CEOs compared to the population of California uh, or the student body makeup uh, of Latinx students, we're nowhere close to, to where it would be uh, parallel to, to those numbers. Uh, next slide, please. So over the last 10 years, the average tenure of a so-called permanent CEO as, a, as opposed to a, a, an interim CEO is just a little bit over five years, which is better than it, than it has been, uh, quite frankly. Uh, of those CEOs who did leave their position, about almost half, about 46% retired uh, or passed away in office, and I can assure you that the majority of those retired. And 21% were either let go or they left for uh, various and sundry reasons. And then 31% uh, took another position. 
And this is one of the challenges, of course, in California, as any trustee knows, once you have a CEO in the seat, uh, it's not too long after they're ensconced in their seat that they're getting calls from um, headhunters, uh, search firms, uh, asking if they'd be interested in another job because there are so many CEO positions in the state of California, about 139. But these were some of the key findings. So um, those are some of the high level findings. And as we mentioned before, we have a dashboard that is available on our website. And so right now, uh, it's my pleasure, I'm gonna turn it over to Brent Johnson and Daniel Molitar, who both work at Analytica Consultant and they do phenomenal work and they're gonna help show uh, how to sort of maneuver and navigate through our CEO dashboard. So gentlemen. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, thank uh, you. Go ahead, Brent. Okay, sure. Um, so just as sort of Larry was saying, uh, this is now available on the website and I'll share my screen so y'all can um, see and we'll do kind of a live demo to walk you through uh, the mechanics of the dashboard. Um, as well as uh, how to use it and how you can uh, continue to tinker with it after uh, this meeting is, is finished. So let me go ahead and share my screen and move you guys out of the way. So um, as mentioned, um, if you go to the CC League uh, website um, into the Research and Data Center, there's a few of the other dashboards that we've um, worked on with uh, the staff over at the League. Um, if you navigate to the CEO tenure dashboard, you can see as of this morning, uh, there's now a blurb about um, kind of the overview that, that Larry had touched on with some of the history, as well as a link to the ninth update um, in PDF form that you can access to read the full report. Uh, the dashboard is meant to be a complementary piece uh, to the more academic report of the, the PDF in that it's interactive and allows you to sort of uh, work with different parameters to see what the, the data has been like over uh, the entire duration of the past 100 plus years, or if you want to look at a narrow window or focus on certain regions or, or groups. So just scrolling down um, a little bit towards uh, the dashboard itself, you can see the data is last updated through uh, the end of the fiscal year uh, 2020. So uh, we've been uh, using this dashboard since 2018 when we first launched the eighth edition and paired this with it. And then we're now updating it on a regular basis uh, with the most recent one uh, following this uh, this ninth edition. If you hover over to the um, Sunburst logo up here on the top right, there are some instructions on how to use this dashboard. So you don't have to necessarily follow everything I'm doing through this uh, quick demo. But if you need a little bit more information about how to navigate or what some of the, the charts mean, uh, that information is here. Uh, below there's also citation information. Uh, we've um, known from past uh, reports and dashboards that folks tend to use this information for other academic studies. So this is the citation information for how to use, how to use that. Um, so starting off at the top, uh, this first chart is also in the report. It's uh, refreshing right now. Um, it's looking at the average number of, um, or sorry, the, the number of male and female CEOs over the duration of the last 100 plus years. So this data goes all the way back to 1913. And you can see the first uh, female CEO started in 1917 and then tracking all the way through um, the end of the fiscal year this year. And then uh, just below that chart is that same sort of distribution, but just looking at out of 100%, so normalizing the total number over time. So you can see sort of that high water mark that we had referenced earlier um, in, I believe it was April of 2020, showing that 45% um, of females at that time. And then this dotted line across the top or across the middle is that 50% threshold. So you can kind of see how it um, roughly equates to uh, the general population, which again is uh, more women than men. Uh, scrolling down a little bit further, um, so this kind of broken up into sections, the format of this is kind of infographic in style. So it's um, some charts and either some accompanying text or the ability to interact uh, with the dashboard um, itself. So I'll scroll, down, I'll scroll down to this second section, which is kind of the meat of the interactivity. And along the left-hand side here are some different filters that allow you to um, toggle with the data and adjust it to your preferences. So the, the main chart here in the center is a scatter plot that shows each of the 130 plus um, colleges and districts uh, within 
uh, California. So as an example, if I look at Sonoma uh, County up here on the top right, the y-axis is the average uh, years of tenure, and then the x-axis is the number of CEOs over that, um, over that college's history. So Sonoma County up here on the top right, they've only had six CEOs um, during their history with an average year of, years of tenure of 17 years. So that kind of puts them in this top right corner. If we look down towards the bottom here, um, and I'll just pick on uh, West Los Angeles College as an example, um, you can see that they've had 21 CEOs over the course of their history, averaging just two and a half years. So the idea being that these lower left corner is kind of the low number of average years of tenure with a high number of CEOs. And towards this upper right is a low number of CEOs with a high um, average years of tenure. And a quick call out on that, um, at the individual college level, we're looking at average years of tenure, just the total number of um, years divided by the, the CEOs. In this chart over here on the bottom right, we also include the median years, which can be more illustrative for kind of the entire population versus at an individual college. And I'll quickly just show um, kind of how the navigation works. So I mentioned the filters along the, the left-hand side. So if I look at a district type, for example, and I select a multi-college district, it then filters that entire group of 130 plus colleges just to the multi-college districts. So you can kind of narrow your view there. Um, same thing goes for region. Um, if I do greater Sacramento, as an example, you can just see the multi-college districts in the greater Sacramento region. So you can really drill down um, to see kind of any gaps in the um, male or female distribution in the sort of timeline up at the top. It also updates the chart in the bottom right. So this is kind of a fully interactive chart that allows you to filter by the type of district, the region, uh, the college itself. If you wanna just narrow into one college, you can do that. Um, as well as the um, types of positions of leadership. The date range here is looking at the entire duration, but you can look at just the last 10 years. Um, so it's really meant to be kind of an interactive tool where you can toggle between uh, different categories. And the last couple are, if you wanna look at just interim or permanent CEOs and then current and past. So just looking at the folks today or over um, the duration. And just uh, one other note on this chart is, um, so if I were to click on Yuba as an example, it also filters this timeline here. So this is a Gantt chart, uh, which is really just a timeline to show each of the lengths of duration. So each of these squares is an individual person. So it shows, um, as an example, um, Daniel Walker served from 1970 to 1983. Um, he was not an interim. So it just kind of gives a little bit more info on just what their specific timeline of that uh, school uh, looked like. Okay, I think that's everything for um, this chart. So um, I'll pass it off to Daniel. He's gonna talk a little bit about um, the next uh, couple sections of the, of the dashboard. Thanks, Brent. And uh, yeah, he wouldn't mind driving for me while we take a tour of the slower section. So this is the map section, essentially. Um, we've got each of the uh, regions spelled out here, uh, both in the columns of the table, as well as in the colors of the map. And those same colors apply to the scatter plot with the uh, with the men and women uh, represented there. So you can see again we've got this kind of um, the scatter sort of same sort of scatter plot that we we saw above, uh, where we've got years of tenure uh, on the uh, bottom instead of uh, 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 at, on the side, uh, and then the number of CEOs on the left. Um, so you can see, uh, for example, um, the, the topmost mark, uh, there were 149 male superintendents in the Southern California region in the history, and they've served an average of 8.3 years. Um, and you can also uh, see some statistics above in that uh, table. If we look uh, at any of those regions, you can see the four chancellors from Southern California uh, have served an average of 12.8 years. So uh, any questions on this chart? This one's pretty uh, straightforward, I think. Um, down here, we've got uh, some statistics broken down by ethnicity as well as by turnover region. So um, in this ethnicity chart, uh, these colors you see aren't just alternating to look pretty, they actually represent whether or not um, that group is over or underrepresented uh, versus their um, the 
so their respective category uh, in the entire population. So you can see Latinx is actually quite severely underrepresented uh, at 16.3% of current CEOs versus 39.4% of all Californians. Um, as our Asian Pacific Islander, there's this, you know, less than half of what the percentage is in the overall population. Uh, and then you can also see both Black, African American, and white um, CEOs are overrepresented. I do want to note, um, you know, we when we were building this, uh, the league uh, wanted to broaden these categories to reflect, um, you know, the sort of changing environment uh, as far as uh, the reporting these kind of categories go. So look for updates next year um, as far as uh, breaking out that other section a little more finely. And then uh, at the bottom here, we've got turnover and reasons for leaving. So you can see the last 10 fiscal years on the left, we break down how many departures there were and um, what was the reason given. Uh, so you can see, for example, like fiscal year 14 didn't have many departures. Um, and then in fiscal year 15, there was kind of a lot of people who were released from their position uh, versus any other year. Um, and then for the entire last year, or for, sorry, for the, for the entire last 10 years, you see these, yeah, these uh, horizontal columns actually represent um, the total breakdown uh, in each of those categories. Uh, so you can see of the CEOs leaving, almost half uh, retired or passed away and uh, about 30% left for another position within uh, the, the community colleges. Um, so this one tells you both uh, the level of turnover and then what's driving that. So and, uh, that is, those are the five sections. Yeah, Brent. Yeah, so we'll, I think we'll wrap there just to give uh, more time for the, the folks, uh, the, leaders, the leaders to talk through that piece. I, I saw one question in the chat about um, if we're going to be providing the ethnicity and uh, more granular uh, data. So I think that's up to the, the league to decide, but kind of as mentioned, I think there's going to be kind of revisiting that section to provide a little bit more info um, at a greater granularity for future versions. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Looks like there's a question from Rosalie or Rosalie uh, about plans to provide data disaggregated by ethnicity. Um, I mean, we did just touch on, we're gonna to try to uh, break out the categories a little more fully uh, in the next iteration of this. Uh, but as far as disaggregated data, uh, I would have to see how uh, Larry and Rena feel about, uh, you know, making that kind of thing uh, broadly available. Ethnicity correlated to tenure and reason for leaving. Uh, I don't think that's possible on the uh, existing version, but that's something we could look into uh, trying to incorporate for next year's. Yeah, and uh, I think there's one other question from, from Rosalie about the sorting option. So yeah, in the scatter plot that we showed at the top, you can sort by uh, region and then individual districts and colleges. Um, we can definitely look at adding that to other pieces of the dashboard if that's of interest. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely take that into consideration. That's a that's a good question. Uh, and as far as uh, Ricky's question here about CEO pay, we did not examine CEO pay in this report. And uh, one last piece, I'm um, just about sharing this and we'll use this as kind of our last question to get to the next section of this, um, this conference um, would be access to the data. So um, it's kind of partially available through this tool in that it shows all of the relevant pieces of that. Um, if there's an idea to share it more broadly or at the actual source file, uh, we can definitely connect with you, Kevin, to see what's available in that space um, to share the actual raw data. And uh, with that, I think we'll um, conclude that piece of our presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Well, thank you, uh, Brent and Daniel. We really uh, appreciate you taking the time today. And I'm going to uh, give you a, 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 a good plug here. I, I would say if any districts out there, if, if you're looking for 
uh, assistance uh, on your website or uh, another way to, to sort of crunch the data and, and use uh, infographics. And uh, not only do they know about uh, Gantt charts and, and scatter plots, uh, they're also just really great to work with, very straightforward. So, uh, you know, if you do have, oh, I'm glad Laura uh, was saying about further questions, you can email us uh, and we'll be happy to, to uh, relay those questions or, or try to respond to them as best we can. So it wasn't until 2014 that the league started asking uh, questions about race and ethnicity and started to uh, include that in the report. And so we plan to continue to do that certainly. And then as both Brent and Daniel mentioned, uh, our desire is to further disaggregate the race and, and ethnicity issue and uh, you know, President Shabazz asked about CEO pay. That was not something that uh, we we have discussed at this point, but sounds like a, a worthwhile discussion to have at the CEO board to see if that's something that would also be useful to include. Uh, I you know, I, so we appreciate any uh, recommendations or suggestions that that you might have. So again, thank you, Daniel and Brent. We really appreciate your time. So with that, take a second for the plug. Absolutely. Um, so so with that, uh, now it's it's our pleasure to to welcome uh, for some of you, three of your colleagues, um, three CEOs who have agreed to uh, speak with us from their perspectives. And our our goal was really to identify three CEOs who are diverse in a variety of ways. Um, so we have uh, with us Chancellor Constance Carroll of the San Diego Community College District. We have uh, Superintendent President Jose Fierro from the Cerritos College, and then Tawny Dotson, the president at Yuba College. And, uh, you know, all three of them were kind enough to take some time out of their very busy schedules and we sent the report to them, the ninth edition, and uh, we just wanted to have a little bit of a discussion. Obviously, the, all three of them have uh, you, you know, unique perspectives in, in a variety of ways, but some of the more uh, evident that we really wanted to have for this discussion is you know, an individual who has uh, considerable experience in the California Community Colleges as a CEO. And uh, Chan uh, Chancellor Carroll, of course, was appointed in 2004 at the San Diego Community College District. So she's been there 16 years. But in addition, uh, she spent 11 years as the president of Mesa College. She was also president of Saddleback, president of Indian Valley Colleges in Marin County, and also one year the interim chancellor of the Marin Community College District. So, uh, you know, one of the longest serving California Community College presidents, actually in the history of California Community Colleges. So, uh, uh, Chancellor Carroll, thank you for spending time, some time with us this morning. And then, Superintendent President uh, Jose Fierro is uh, started his tenure at Cerritos College in 2015. And prior to that, he served as the VP of Academic Affairs and the Chief Academic Officer at Laramie County Community College in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I, also, I know he was also in, in Florida. Um, and so from our perspective, comparatively, uh, 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 Dr. Fierro is, we'll, we'll say, sort of mid-career or, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, well, in the middle compared to some of the longer longer serving uh, CEOs or, or newer CEOs. So thank you, uh, Jose, for being here. We appreciate it. And then we also have uh, Tani Dotson, who has the very unique uh, perspective, uh, although not the sole person, but we have some of our CEOs now who um, started their tenure in California during the pandemic uh, shutdown. And they've never had the opportunity 
to um, be face to face for long periods of time or even short periods of time with their colleagues, with students. And it's certainly a unique perspective. Uh, so we wanted to, we asked President Dotson if she would be kind enough to be here. She served as the Yuba College president uh, since July of 2020 and began her career as an active duty Air Force officer at Beale Air Force Base. And after transitioning off uh, active duty, she worked at post-secondary education institutions in Oklahoma, Washington, and California, and has been a guest lecturer on a variety of topics, uh, has been a director and a special assistant to the president uh, and chief of staff and vice president before her current role as president of Yuba College. So uh, uh, welcome. Uh, Dr. Dotson, and thank you for being here this afternoon. We appreciate it. Um, so my first question is, is, will be a general one, and I'll just to, to make it perhaps easier, I, I will ask uh, uh, Chancellor Carroll if you wouldn't mind uh, responding first. So uh, you had a chance, I hope, to take a look at the ninth edition of the CEO tenure and retention report. And I, I just wanted to get any general impressions that you have or things that, that maybe stood out to you or any really anything you wanted to comment on. Yes, I, I thought the uh, the report was very uh, interesting and very similar to, um, to the last, um, uh, uh, to the previous uh, uh, report, not too, many, too much change. Um, the, the one thing that I would be interested in or in reasons for leaving, um, the report does not really address the issue of boards of trustees or uh, collective bargaining. So I think it would be useful at some point to have that <clears throat> those as a, a component uh, in in the report, uh, because from from my perspective, those are are two critical uh, issues in addition to the. Um, to the budget. I think we're one of few states uh, where we have this, uh, I, I think of it as a triad, we have a single source of revenue basically, which is uh, the um, uh, system, the California Community Colleges. Then we have elected uh, uh, trustees and we have collective bargaining. Uh, all in, in, in the same in the same mix and sometimes that can be the perfect storm uh, for a number of CEOs. So I'll, I'll be happy to respond later, but I, I found that missing the rest was interesting. The increase in, in the number of women um, is interesting uh, because when I joined um, the California Community Colleges uh, uh, actually 43 years ago in uh, 1977, uh, I was one of only five women in, in the entire system. And so there's been a lot of change uh, in, in that regard. Indeed. Well, thank you. So Dr. Fierro, anything that you'd like to just point out uh, or any responses? Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Larry. Appreciate the opportunity of uh, being here with everyone today. Uh, I did have the opportunity to review the report Report and, and it's a very good report. And one of the things that I think is most important of the, this report is bringing attention to a very important topic. Um, oftentimes we talk about retention of faculty and staff and mid-management administrators, but we seldom talk about uh, retention of CEOs. And I think the league has been doing a great job bringing this to the forefront. And as the report clearly states, uh, there are no number of benefits, obviously, with uh, retention. But beyond that, many of us embark in this journey, uh, not just to be the CEO, but, but because we feel that we can make a difference and, and increasing the longevity uh, in our jobs allows to collaborate with others to do just that. Uh, everyone has a role within the organization. Oftentimes ours is an ad with the different interest groups, but, but our role is actually to represent everyone. Uh, and I think the investing in the longevity and um, bringing this topic to the forefront uh, help us all to understand the, 
the supporting the CEOs is also important that they also produce the, the desired results uh, on a student success in particular. Uh, something that I found interesting is uh, how the cost of looking for a, C, a new CEO is broken down in the report. And I will argue that the cost outlined there is actually lower than the reality. Yes, you could find a search group that maybe charge you 20,000, 30,000, some maybe in excess of $100,000. But to me, that is not necessarily the real cost. The real cost is the lack of productivity during the exit of the current CEO and the one or two years, in some cases, in the best case scenario, that will take a new CEO to go back to the same level of productivity is the outgoing one. And at the current salaries, uh, we can agree or disagree that our salaries are too high or too low, but it still is a significant amount of time to have uh, a decline in productivity. Uh, when you look at CEOs that are living under distress, often it's a process that is a year, a year and a half, in which not only the CEO, but the college as a whole is much less productive. Then you account the transition time uh, in which you bring an interim or whatever is happening at that particular time, a low time in productivity and distress for the community and the institution, and when you bring the, the new CEO, if you bring in someone that is uh, first presidency, um, which is the case of most of us, uh, you're talking about another couple of years. So, so it could be easily four years of lack of productivity and distress for a district uh, when you're talking about costs. So, so the search consultant is probably the least of our concerns uh, when we talk about cost on the CEO. So I would like to see that uh, address in the future because um, I think that will really send a clear message that it's just not about those dollars spent during the search, but the impact that it has the community as a whole in the, in the short, middle and long term. Thank you. Uh, President Dotson, any reactions to the report or anything that you wanted to highlight? Yeah, thank you so much. So first, just uh, grateful for the opportunity to be included on this panel and amongst this group of leaders. So thank you. Um, I, I, you know, one thing that was mentioned briefly is that I'm coming back, you know, back to California, but this is my first time coming into the California education system. And so a better understanding of where CEOs are coming from would be helpful, particularly if we look at it um, from a gender perspective as well, because we know there's data out there that talks about uh, females path to the presidency versus a male tends to be a little bit different. It would be helpful to understand that. Um, but I, I did enjoy reading the report and I will just share a couple of uh, initial reactions. Um, you know, the first is that as we increase in the number of female CEOs, I hope we are also doing some work to prepare our systems and institutions for what it takes to attract and retain uh, women in leadership positions. Um, that certainly starts by having a really open and upfront com uh, conversation about the social norms impact on women uh, versus men. Um, you know, that's saying out loud that there's an expectation that uh, when, you know, women are strong leaders, sometimes people call them bossy and we need to, you know, change that perspective. Um, also, I think a, um, a unintended but fantastic benefit of the pandemic is that we're changing our paradigm and expectations around flexible work. Um, I am a young uh, CEO and also a mother of a 16, 13, and eight-year-old. Um, and in order to be able to be successful, I need to be in a place where uh, people value and understand uh, that work does not always occur sitting in a specific chair at a specific table, that it happens in a lot of places. We're certainly demonstrating that, you know, right here and right now, and we're learning that. So I'm certainly grateful to see that transition occur. I will tell you pre-pandemic, that was not a pervasive expectation of what work looked like. Um, and as we begin to replace the CEOs that are uh, listed in the report as, uh, you know, reaching that point of retirement, 
um, there it is more likely that many of us are going to be coming in uh, from a younger perspective and we need to be uh, ready to support us. Um, also, you know, thinking about um, our leave and uh, childcare options, you know, is important. Um, I will also tell you one thing as a new, brand new CEO in the middle of a pandemic, um, keeping in mind that the, the rules and the research are out the window. Um, I, I participated in the presidential fellowship. I read the books. I saw all of the papers. I did all the things that they told me I needed to do to be ready to be a president. And none of them helped on July 13, not one of them. Uh, I couldn't walk around and have conversations with people. I couldn't set up times to go meet faculty in their programs. Um, I couldn't do those things. Uh, and so it has looked a lot different. Uh, to me uh, to, you know, join this group and, and join as a president. Um, and it has been a little bit more challenging, but also a great opportunity, uh, you know, to be innovative. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is, as we do have younger leaders uh, take these roles, we have to remember that uh, they have a, a small or, or no, um, no safety net. Um, you know, we are, we are younger. Um, we, we certainly would like to be in these positions. I know as a mother, I um, expect to be in this position until after my eight-year-old uh, graduates from high school. My boss is on here, so, or longer. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we want to be here for a long time, and we need to remember that in these times where we're asking people to be very bold and courageous leaders, you know, we are doing it with a uh, limited or, you know, no safety net. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind, both as a CEO network and as boards um, and as a system as a whole. Wonderful. Um, so perhaps your Air Force training has been the most useful. Um, but that is a really important point because you do hear experienced CEOs who say, and observe, you know, you need to be able to walk away from the job. And theoretically, that makes a lot of sense. But if you have uh, three children, uh, it's, it makes it a, a lot more challenging. Fortunately, you have a fantastic chancellor uh, who's, uh, I, I think, uh, very, very understanding and will will work with you well. So you, all of you brought up some wonderful points. So uh, Chancellor Carroll, if I can go back to you. I'm hoping we have some trustees that are in the audience. Uh, and I don't know if we're in the morning or the afternoon. If it's uh, Cerritos, it's the morning for Sacramento. I'm calling it the afternoon, I don't know. But um, Chancellor Carroll, what would your message be to trustees in terms of how they might support, you know, what are some important ways that they should can and, and should support their CEOs, uh, you know, to help them uh, as they they work, hopefully in partnership with their board. Well, the 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 first thing is it comes up from time to time uh, that the board only has one employee, and that is the uh, that is the CEO, and the board members can be most helpful in understanding that uh, that point, uh, especially in multi college districts where there can be a tendency. Uh, for uh, broader in, in, in interactions with, with faculty, with, with, with other people within the district. But the, the board needs to understand and, uh, and support the fact that the CEO is the leader of the district. Um, and, uh, and, so, and, and that's very important. Uh, board members also should take an interest in the welfare of the CEO. Uh, because CEOs are not always going to come forward with, with requests for things. Board members should um, uh, 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 wonder about whether or not the CEO might want a sabbatical uh, why, uh, and other things that the, the CEO may need. Care and feeding of the CEO uh, and being supportive uh, is very, very important because the CEO, especially, you know, it, it has no peer. Board members have other board members to talk with. Um, uh, in a multi-college district, presidents have other presidents to talk with. Everyone does, but there, there's only one um, uh, chancellor uh, of, of the district. And that person has a lot of pressure because there, are, there is no um, uh, collegial support network within the district. 
not not if the job is going to be done uh, uh, properly. One can have relationships, but not friendships. Uh, one can have collegial interaction, but they there's a, a a limit to them. So board members need to understand that about their CEO and uh, and bend over backwards uh, to to nurture and and support them uh, in their role. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fierro, uh, what would be your advice to a board member or boards who are listening uh, that seek to maintain their, the health and welfare of their CEO and, and create good conditions for them? Mm, in my experience, the one experience I have, uh, I think it's important um, for the board to be clear on what they're looking for from the moment they're hired, and equally important for the CEO to be clear of the expectations that they have. In other words, don't sell, on either case, something that you're not. Um, meaning, uh, if I'm not a fit for the college and I really want to be a president, it's probably better to pass on that particular college and go to the one that you'd have fit. And if you really, really like this guy, but you know, the ideas that this person or, or, or this um, um, lady brings to the uh, college are not necessarily in alignment with our values as a board, pass on that candidate as well. Because uh, uh, I think in order to be successful as a CEO and as a trustee, uh, I think it's uh, important to have clear alignment of expectations. I have been fortunate The what I presented to the board, it seemed to align what they, what, with what they wanted. And I have been fortunate they, they, that I was, that was the case. So we have had some tough times in the early goings, but because we both were working on the same direction, um, it was easy to navigate. The, the other part as a new trustee, I think it's important to understand that you're hiring another human being, not a magician. And, and, and most of the experiences that we run and, and, and um, confront as CEOs are new. And yes, there are some things that happen year after year and a collection of experiences make you better at handling them, but none of us knew how to handle the pandemic. So a little bit of grace uh, from the board and, and, and giving you the opportunity to, to, to get used to those pieces is important. Um, so, so my advice would be make sure that you're hiring the correct person, someone that aligns with your ideas, not someone that is selling you something good. Um, for the CEO, same thing. If, if you feel that you're not in alignment with the culture of the district or with the ideas that the trustees are bringing forward, pass on it. Uh, there, there are other presidencies, as we already know. And lastly, uh, allowed the person want to make mistakes and to learn how to handle a specific situations without getting to the point of first mistake, you're out as we've seen in, uh, in a few cases, actually, even in the recent years. Thank you. So President Dotson, um, feel free to elaborate on any of the points you brought up, uh, being a, a younger president, uh, being a, a woman president, uh, being in a you know, rural serving area, and then uh, starting out uh, in this global pandemic environment where you've not had the opportunity to quote unquote, you know, press the flesh and walk around and, and see people uh, at their desks and meet with students. Um, I, again, you know, as we, there's uncertainty, but what, what would be your advice to trustees and, and maybe even uh, women who are considering the next move to, to look at becoming a, a, a college president or a chancellor. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you a lot of different things, that, but uh, interested in, in your perspective uh, on, on any or, or all of those. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Um, I think what Dr. Fierro just um, shared is an incredibly important point, and I hope that the aspiring uh, presidents and CEOs in the room really heard what he said. Um, as an ambitious person, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, decades uh, preparing for the opportunity to be a president. And when it presented, you know, it, when the timing was right for my family and I, you know, we started searching. Um, I um, cannot understate the importance of making sure that it's the right fit, um, not just the uh, job being offered to you. Um, and the reason that I think that's important is that uh, I, I joined a college and took a presidency um, where I had to move uh, two states away. Um, I am you know, currently separated from my husband because he's finishing his active duty career. Um, and so we are two states away from each other. Um, my, you know, my family is in a distance education situation. The college is in a distance education situation. The power went out on the first day of the fall semester. Um, the, you know, worst wildfire season that California has seen in recent history. Um, and all of those things can feel very overwhelming. But at the core of everything that has been happening, and I've said this to my uh, colleagues and you know, to the chancellor and to the trustees, and that is that um, because I was careful to make a decision about going to a place that I knew my values and my skills and my abilities um, brought the right things to the table, and conversely, that they did the same thing, uh, that they knew we were all moving in the same direction, all of those things haven't felt overwhelming. They felt uh, like challenges and opportunities, but they've, you know, certainly felt right. Um, and, and so we've, you know, been able to make the last uh, few months work and, you know, I'm still, you know, working hard, but very glad to be here. Um, I think it's important that at each opportunity um, that the leadership, whether that's the trustees or the chancellor, you know, in my case, um, communicate very consistently, um, have, you know, critical conversations about expectations. Um, and at the end of each of those conversations, make sure we always end by saying that we have each other's back um, because it's, it's that kind of a relationship where we can have a very open conversation, perhaps even disagree. Um, but at the end of it, we understand that we're going to make a decision and you know we're in this together. Um, and I think that's really important uh, for everybody to remember. Thank you. Um, Chancellor Carroll, so um, I was going to ask a question about collective bargaining, uh, but we only have two hours or no. Um, so that, that, is, that is a very uh, challenging set of circumstances, especially now that we're in a, a recession, uh, an extraordinary recession that happened so quickly. Um, and, and feel free to comment more on that. But I, I did want to ask you, you know, we're, we're also in this remarkable period, or maybe not so remarkable, but where um, we have, you know, especially after the, the murder of George Floyd, uh, we're in a, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, racial reckoning and civil unrest. And uh, a lot of questions are being asked. And I'm wondering from your perspective, um, Perhaps if you can just reflect on, has that had uh, an impact on 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 how you're you're doing your job as a as a chancellor of, of San Diego or anything that you wanted to uh, comment on the set of circumstances? The, the first thing I would say is that it's important to understand the history of the California Community Colleges. And I've been working in in this particular role or similar role, either president or chancellor for 43 years. And um, as they say, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is cyclical in the California community colleges. The, um, all you have to do is go back five years and you can find a prototype for whatever the, the trends are currently. Uh, whether it's budget, you can go back to partnership for excellence and uh, to uh, uh, 361 to um, student-centered funding formula. Uh, uh, for uh, student success, you can start with matriculation, which was supposed to be the be all and end all of uh, student success measures and, and the like. So everything has a history. 
and racial tensions also has have a history. We all went through uh, the riots uh, that followed the uh, the Rodney King incident. Uh, these these issues are not new. The the issue is how you put together teams of people, establish relationships and systems for uh, for dealing uh, for dealing with them. Uh, the um, the challenges that uh, we're all facing, I think, uh, from the, the the racial unrest, since you asked about that, um, are uh, are not new, and they're are they're predictable. What's new is the intensity because of the um, uh, the uh, governmental context federally in which they are occurring that makes us all feel uh, vulnerable. The um, the big issue within the San Diego Community College District right now from all four institutions is uh, the uh, college police. Um, everyone has switched gears and focused on whether or not we should have college police, defund the police, uh, what are we going to do with that? And that so that, that taps into um, uh, uh, one's ability to know how to put together a process processes for having a debate, uh, for handling the debate, and for making sure that, that uh, right decisions are made rather than reacting uh, to all of the things that come up. So I think um, the, uh, the, the CEO role right now is critical <clears throat> because we have uh, a, a perfect storm of racial un unrest mixed with um, a horrific budget uh, situation and a pandemic. This is new. This, this, this conflation of um, uh, items is new and, and they, they are very taxing for CEOs. But, but if one looks to the past and what works and looks to one's own strength, um, uh, one, one can, can master them. The, the, the most, um, the, the, as I said, the problem uh, the issue in our district that's getting the most attention right now is college police, uh, more than any, uh, more than anything else. And uh, and so we we have a good process and we're handling that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions later. But um, but 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 my message is to have good data systems in place so that you you're all, all always ready to address the latest new issue that comes up. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Fierro, um, just from, from your perspective on what's happening in Cerritos and anything you, you might want to convey to your, your colleagues or to trustees or what, what's happening uh, on your campus? Um, I mean, I, I don't think we're necessarily any different on a special than the other community colleges. I mean, when I speak in public, I usually say we are better than a special, but we all know we, we, we face very similar situations. And, and, and I think um, what we're experiencing is completely redefining uh, what is meant to be a CEO. Uh, in fact, the last few weeks uh, I've been thinking is it's like, like what, how much work I have done over the last month, over the last two months. But the work that I have done is not necessarily tangible. It, it, it is, it, you know, sometimes when you're at the office, you do a lot of computer work, you meet with people, you make decisions and, and, and things that you can quantify and are a little more tangible. But I find myself often wondering if I'm actually doing my job because I can not necessarily see the product of what I'm doing, uh, because it's, it's, it's addressing some of the social unrest, it's providing a little bit of guidance, a little bit of hope, turning that light on for people to continue to move. And, and those things are incredibly difficult to, to quantify. And, and that in the back of, you know, be sure to manage the budget, uh, be sure to keep the uh, contracts going and so on and so forth makes it a very unique environment that, that I don't think um, we will go back to the type of work that we used to do. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say here is that as we move forward as CEOs or aspiring CEOs, is uh, 
probably more important than ever to train ourselves, mentor others and train others to learn how to develop empathy, how to develop emotional intelligence and how uh, to navigate political, social and uh, environmental issues all at once. Not necessarily an expert on each one of those, but how you interconnect them all to help uh, your teams move forward. Um, but, but I find one thing oftentimes where I don't know I'm actually doing my job because I, I can't point to a lot of things in quantity. It's a lot of talking, I guess, what I'm doing lately. And at, the, at our Leadership Academy, um, more than one of your colleagues mentioned just that. I mean, it's ab the, the jobs are often uh, abstract, um, you know, maybe graduation or certain initiatives come to, to the fore, but quite often uh, it's, it's not like a football team where you, oh, we lost or we won. And, and now this, this physical separation makes that even more abstract. Uh, so it is a challenge. Um, President Dotson, um, uh, anything that you care to comment on, on based on what you, what you just heard or what I asked about? Yeah, well, I, I will start by saying I'm a, a very transparent uh, gal and when people ask me questions, I, I go right to it. So I want to just clarify, you, I used the word separated and meant distance from my husband. I saw a few people <laughs> look up like, whoa, uh, he is, is retiring from active duty. So we're separated by states. Uh, <laughs> Um, I didn't. I didn't want to give that impression. Um, I. I will just say that um, I am a, a producer and outcomes person, and um, so it definitely um, has been a challenge. Uh, like Dr. Fierro said, uh, because I want to see things, you know, be accomplished and move forward. But I've um, found um, great. Um, uh, comfort in also realizing that my role is to be that sort of both the holder and the the beacon uh, to let people know that they are you know still moving in the right direction and doing the right things but also to create an environment where I help them to say this is what we really need to be focusing on right now um, for our students and you know the direction that we're heading moving forward um, I also, um, you know, is probably just evidence because I admitted in front of hundreds of you that I made a mistake, um, you know, don't really try not to lead too much from a place of fear. Um, and that's what it's going to take to be successful right now because, um, you know, both Dr. Carroll and Dr. Fierro have said um, there's no playbook for this. Um, uh, what we have to do is, you know, face this head on and be willing to have the open conversations about where we are and about the different sides of issues um, and, you know, keep moving forward uh, with a solution and a transition about how we do our work. So uh, one more question, if, if I might. Um, the challenges are, are monumental and we just covered a few, uh, but, uh, I, with Pam Luster as the CEO board chair, uh, uh, I, I, I think if I were channeling her, she would, she would ask or want uh, me to ask, uh, what keeps you going and, and what are some of the rewards that, that really are meaningful to you uh, in, in your position? And again, we might have some individuals who are watching this and our aspiring CEOs and presidents. And so would be interested, uh, Chancellor Carroll, if you could talk about that. Well, there are, are, there are several things and I, I, I'm blessed because uh, Pam Luster is, is one of our presidents in, uh, in our district and um, uh, uh, very um, uh, accomplished and someone of whom I'm proud and she's also my friend. Um, so, um, the, uh, the, the rewards are, are, are enormous. The first is that you get to make a difference, that your, your leadership uh, results in um, an, or, uh, an organization that supports faculty to do their best, classified professionals to do their best, uh, and, it, and uh, other administrators who are um, uh, uh, talented. Uh, but above all, it uh, helps transform the lives of students. And so literally every decision you make 
every decision you make. How many classes are going to be online? How many are going to be hybrid? These decisions look small, but they have huge impact uh, upon individuals. And when you, you uh, understand that, that ev literally everything you do, uh, which, which may not be recorded, uh, which may not be documented, but it's something that you know in, in, in your heart and memory has made these tremendous changes, um, uh, th that is, is worth it. And uh, at commencements, even though we were, I think all of us virtual uh, uh, this year, we can see it. Uh, we can see it in the faces of the students and their families. And so it's our central mission from which, which should uh, give us um, the strength and affirmation that carries us forward. It, it, it certainly is for me. I enjoy every day. I, I even enjoy the negative things uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that happen um, uh, because no matter what, uh, it leads to something that's going to benefit uh, people in, in very deep and material ways. President Fierro. Um, well, the first addressing uh, having uh, Pam uh, representing the CEO board, I, I think it was um, a great choice. Uh, multiple reasons. I, I remember uh, one of the first people that I met at the state was Pam, and I clearly remember a meeting we had in uh, San Diego with um, Luke and Frank. Uh, we were in a panel, and uh, Pam was in the audience, and uh, Juliana Barnes, who may be here with us too, we talked about uh, being new CEOs. That was, I think both of us were present in the CEOs and you know, you come with all kinds of ideas and enthusiasm, the quickly skill, just kidding. Um, but you come with a lot of ideas and enthusiasm and, and we said that we were going to do what it took to do things right and committed to do that in front of the audience and said they, and someone said that sometimes those things lead into deciding to do the right thing or keeping your job. And we said that we will choose to do the right thing. And Pam in the audience said, well, I have a big house with an empty room or something like that. So you kind of stay here <laughs> till the next one. And I know it was a, a, a kind of a joking, but, but that is the type of colleague I think Pam is and the type of person that the Pam is. So having her, uh, working at, um, at the board as a CEO, uh, uh, at the president of the CEO board is important because it helps us to continue to march in a mission that is doing the right thing, doing what's right for the students and, and keeping our priorities straight. Uh, I know that under pressure sometimes it's easy to make compromises and sometimes compromises need to be made. But, but I think when, when we talk about the well-being of our students and the education, uh, the, the education of the future, the future of education, uh, the stability of the community colleges, I don't think compromises are a good thing. I think oftentimes we compromise too many times and it's hard to climb back from, from a deficit. Um, so, so I think that uh, that approach, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, and, and, uh, and the opinion of you that, that, that I know is, is welcome. And, and, and as I said, it's great to have Pam with that vision uh, uh, pushing uh, in, in a very steady direction. So, so usually I'm okay with compromises, but not in, in these type of uh, cases. President Dotson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, I've lived a life, life of service. And so I, you know, want to remain in a place where I'm, you know, making a difference. Um, I remember the very first time that I taught a communication studies class and I was, you know, sitting down with a student who was really struggling. Um, we spent a lot of extra time together trying to help them to understand the concept I was sharing. And I remember the look on their face when they got it, um, you know, that light bulb moment, um, of, you know, putting all of this hard work in and then, you know, finally 
getting to where it was that they you know wanted to get um, and it's still that sort of light bulb moment that drives me every day uh, just in different scenarios um, i think as you move up through the you know chain if you will um, and uh, higher and higher and then become a ceo you have a chance to create those light light bulb moments not only for students but for all of the employees that work with and for you um, and when we're working through hard things the thing that drives me and helps me to know that i'm doing the right thing and in the right place is that is those light bulb moments sometimes little ones sometimes big ones uh, hard ones and easy ones but seeing people around you succeed and getting to do that at the the level and the breadth and depth you get to do that as a president is you know what makes uh, even the hardest moments of this job worth it well, all three, thank you so much for spending some time with us and, and sharing uh, your perspectives on, on just a few issues. Uh, from my perspective uh, and from the league staff's perspective, we're very grateful that you, you, you were able to, uh, to participate in this. And um, thank you. Thank you all three. And shameless plug, uh, I'm going to give two shameless plugs here. Number one is, uh, I know you're Everyone here and, and others are interested in hearing more um, from Chancellor Carroll. And so the league's first podcast, which is gonna focus on community college leaders, uh, we will be recording that in the not too distant future and Chancellor Carroll will be the first uh, league podcast uh, guest. So uh, we will provide more information and that will be forthcoming. Look forward to that conversation uh, with you, Constance. Uh, thank you all three. We're really grateful to you. And that I guess the second uh, shameless plug uh, is please do, uh, I, would, I would urge all of you to take some time and, and take a look at the uh, ninth edition of the CEO uh, tenure and retention study. And, and we appreciate some of the recommendations that you've gotten. Even um, I saw Claudia Habib mentioned uh, no confidence votes and maybe we need to look at that and, and, and the impact of that and the numbers on that. Um, and, you know, of course, the league has a variety of resources and opportunities for CEOs and for trustees. And there's a list right there of some of the opportunities for ongoing professional development and support. Um, what I've seen in any of these, the strategic leadership program or um, the, the statewide convenings, uh, you know, just making connections with one another, because as Chancellor Carroll said, these are, can be, although rewarding jobs, they're, they're, they're unique jobs and they can be lonely uh, and, and difficult. Uh, and I, I don't think any of these people feel sorry for themselves, but they're just really challenging. And sometimes it's only another CEO who actually can, can fully understand uh, what you're going through and the, and the challenges that you have. Um, finally, I would say that uh, to those trustees who uh, are participating, uh, thank you for, for what you do. Your, your position is so important in the community and at the college and the district. And certainly there are some CEOs who are uncomfortable asking for support at the same time, uh, if you're able to support their ongoing professional development, we would say, uh, take a look at what the league does, uh, Wheelhouse and, and some others. So with that, um, I don't know if there are any other slides. I think we just have the thank you slide. If you hung in there this long, you get a gold star. Um, uh, thank my colleagues uh, uh, and GR and thank Analytica. And again, I wanna thank Chancellor Constance Carroll Superintendent President Jose Fierro and President uh, Tani Dotson uh, for being our guest today. With that, I wish you the best of, uh, afternoon and thank you.